I, I'm, I'm, I have a bit of a uh, soft spot for libraries. I, I love libraries, and uh, even though my home library is a Mountain View, um, we go every week, at least once a week, if not twice, for the whole family, and, and we, just, we just love libraries. So I said, okay, I'll do it. Um, and so she said, well, please give me a title. And uh, you know, a couple times she asked me, and I finally just, okay, I'll just make something up. So I said, okay, well, how about, okay, I, I do Positron stuff. Uh, okay, Positron, lasers, and robots. How about that? Um, and then I said, well, that doesn't, that's not enough. And so I said, well, what about, uh, okay, I'll add, I'll add something uh, about Asimov, because this is, after all, about uh, uh, Isaac Asimov. So I said, uh, okay, how close does our science come to Asimov's vision of the future? So I said, okay, well, you know, that, that sounds good. She said, okay, fine, thank you. And this was months ago. And then, uh, you know, months went by, and I kind of said, well, I better start you know, getting that talk together. And so I said, well, I got the positrons, lasers, and robots part down pretty well. That's pretty easy. But boy, this vision of uh, Asimov's future, why did I put that? I mean, am I going to have to read all the hundreds of books that he put down to, to figure out what his vision is? Well, it turns out that immediately I find this article that he wrote in 1964 that says exactly what his vision of 2014 is going to look like. <laughs> and I said, this guy is good. Talk about predicting the future. He knew immediately, he somehow he knew that I was going to be giving a talk about this. It was, it was incredible. And he did this uh, in conjunction with the World's Fair. And let's take this out here so I can... Uh, so he, he did this in conjunction with when he was at the World's Fair, and uh, he kind of, you know, 1964, this is in New York City, and he, you know, said what he, what he thought the future was going to look like. So uh, let's go through some of these predictions that he thought it was going to look like during our time as we're living. So keep in mind, he did this, he, he made these predictions 50 years ago. It's pretty impressive. So first thing he said was, okay, robots will be neither common nor very good in 2014, but they will be in existence. And he's right. Uh, you know, we, have, we have a lot of robots. Here's the DARPA uh, Robotics Challenge. Uh, if you go to the website, you can see a bunch of movies like this where the robots are kind of walking around, but they walk very slow. This is about as fast as they walk. They've got hours of video, and you'll see for 15 minutes, the, the robots will be like this. And so, you know, you, you'll watch that, and for a while, they'll just be moving very slowly, and then suddenly, they'll fall. <laughs> so he was exactly right. We, they're, they're, they're not very common, and they're not very good. But to, to be fair, the, you know, if, you spend, if you spend some time on that Robotics Challenge website, what you'll see is that the robots are pretty, pretty impressive. They, they can drive a vehicle. Uh, they can get out of the vehicle. They can go to a door. They can open the door. They can uh, go to a valve. They can turn that valve and do stuff. And when you see a movie of... Of a, of a big piece of metal like this walking upstairs, it's 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 pretty amazing. So I recommend you, you go to the website and uh, and check out some of these. Okay, so let's look at some other predictions that he made. Um, one, uh, he said, okay, large solar powered stations will also be in operation in a number of desert and semi desert areas like Arizona and Kazakhstan. In the more crowded, but cloudy and smoggy areas, solar power will be less practical. So he was right again. Here are you know. They were, We've got solar farms uh, <clears throat> in, uh, the, in the deserts. We have like 500 megawatt uh, power plants, three of them in, in the U.S. And so it's very clear that uh, you know he kind of kind of nailed this one. And in, in fact, the lab we just put up on Vasco. I don't know if you guys uh, saw that. We put up a solar array, a photovoltaic uh, uh, solar array, where uh, it's a three megawatt system that uh, this. Uh, UV uh, America put up. So this is, uh, you know, he's, he's pretty good about that one. Uh, what else did he say in that, in that article? Uh, he said, well, by 2014, only unmanned ships will have landed on Mars. And he's right. Uh, that's that's what's, what's happened. I mean, this, this, uh, this is a curiosity, taking a self-portrait on Mars, and he would be happy to see that there's a robot on Mars. Um, his next prediction, and, and he said, though a man, manned expedition will be in the works. And he's, he's right about that, too. Uh, it turns out that the, uh, you know, the only man that we've managed to put on Mars was uh, Matt Damon. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, uh, so I don't know, by the way, I don't know how many of you have uh, read, read the book, uh, The Martian. Oh, look at this, it's wonderful. Yeah, I'm in the library, so I shouldn't be surprised. It's, it's a fantastic book. Uh, Andy Weir came and spoke at our lab. He was uh, his delightful speaker. He's a great guy, and uh, it was a really great story to hear how how he you know went through this whole process. 
So uh, uh, anyway, so <clears throat> but but Asimov is right. The man mission is in the works. So we have uh, all the technologies that NASA uh, is develop that NASA is actually developing. All these technologies, like the habitat, the plant farm, water recovery, all these things that Mark Watney kind of had to go through, um, you know, that he was using, are actually real technology. So uh, that, that people are developing for Mars. So, um, like, you know, so nobody's perfect, right? I mean, he was uh, he was way off on his last prediction. He said, "Mankind will suffer badly from the disease of boredom in 2014, a disease spreading more widely each year and growing in intensity." And you know that you know if he was just alive today and he looked around, he would see that you know everyone is very excited. <laughs> you, you can see these people and. You can, see, you can see the excitement, and you, and you wonder what, what they're doing on those phones, and you, you, know, you just kind of go look, and you see, well, what's trending now? And, you know, I mean, of course, how could you not be excited with, with uh, content like this? So, so anyway, okay, so let's start talking about Asma. Uh, okay, he, he's a pretty amazing guy. And now, I wasn't sure exactly what the level uh, to, to talk at, so I have a lot of different... A lot of a lot of different. Uh, it is work. Yeah, this is pretty good. Okay, um, so I have a, a lot of uh, different levels. So bear with me if there's something that you know doesn't make sense or whatever. Uh, hopefully the next thing will. Um, so let's let's think about this book he did called The Currents of Space. Now in this in this book there is this planet called Florina. Florina. Uh, is a particular place that's uh, circling, it's orbiting this star where anywhere else in the galaxy, if you plant cotton, you get cotton, except on Florina, when you plant a cotton seed, you get something called curd. And it's a very special kind of cloth that, you know, it just everyone in the galaxy wants it. It's the best thing ever, and, you know, it's, it's, it's really beautiful, and, um, but, but no one can reproduce it anywhere else, and they don't understand why. Uh, well, it turns out that uh, it turns out that Asimov came up with this notion of, and this is kind of an insight into how he kind of weaves scientific fact into his science fiction and really makes it exciting and interesting. Um, I think what he was trying to do is he was saying, okay, look, I need a way that I can get people to uh, inhabit a planet that's just about ready to go uh, become a supernova. And so now, normally, you you know, you would know that that you know you, you can't say, uh, you know, he, he couldn't just say, um, okay, you know, what what uh, you know, this is what we think of when we think of a, how will a supernova occur? Well, a type one supernova. Uh, it turns out that there's a um, unfortunately I don't have a, a laser pointer, but um, the normal star down there in the lower left uh, is just you know, helium and, and hydrogen, uh, and it's burning its hydrogen, uh, but it's next to a dwarf star, a, a white dwarf, that's mo it's kind of burned up all its hydrogen fuel, and now it's just mostly carbon and, and, nit and oxygen and things like this, and it's, but and it's falling out itself, it has so much gravitational attraction that it's, that it's attracting a lot of matter off of the normal star, and it's accreting and circular, circling around and, and accreting onto the, uh, the white dwarf. So what's, what, what's, what happens if, if that does occur, if, if, if you get enough matter, if, that, if enough matter gets onto that white dwarf, that white dwarf will um, start burning again, but it will start burning its carbon. And it will do it very quickly, and it will be a giant explosion, and that will be the supernova. But of course you couldn't make a story that says, well, people are going to live by that, because they would know that, okay, that's a supernova. So what he does instead is he, he was very, very clever idea, and he said, okay, I'm going to take a regular star, but I'm going to make up something called a carbon current, so that there are these currents, just like currents in the ocean, there are these, there are these currents uh, of different materials, and one happens to be carbon, and this star happens to be sitting on, on, in this current, and as time goes on, it's accumulating carbon. So it's the inverse. It's, you're, you're not adding hydrogen to a carbon star, you're adding carbon to a hydrogen star. And that's how he gets it to be a, a thing that, oh, these people suddenly realize the reason that they're growing Florina, uh, the reason on Florina that they're growing this curve is because it's just that they're, they're sitting next to a star that's about to go and become a supernova. 
So it's really cool the way that he kind of uh, you know, uses this interesting science fact. Um, so, um, so now the question is, uh, what is fusion? Okay, so it turns out, as we know, all the stars make their energy from fusion, and as well as the supernova explosion was a manifestation of fusion. So what is what is fusion? Well, we know that fusion. Um, uh, we know that fusion is the kind of the main thing for the stars. Um, let's see. I don't. Uh, let's see. So you're gonna. Uh, let's see. Let's see if this is the one. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. So what's fusion? Well. So fusion is when you take light elements, and this is this is a picture of the, the surface of the sun, and you can see uh, all this burning uh, plasma is very hot. Um, and what's happening here is that hydrogen they're forcing hydrogen atoms together to create helium. So you're making you're taking things of light elements, taking lighter elements, and you're putting them together, and you're creating heavier elements. So for example, you take a bunch of hydrogen, put them together, you can make helium. And that, and if you see how much mass you end up with in the helium, and you look at how much mass you started with in the hydrogen, there's some missing mass. And it turns out that that missing mass goes into energy in the form of energetic particles that were created in the, in the process. So anyway, uh, but I think we can, um, let's see, so we can uh, go on. And so like I say, uh, you start off with the the periodic table, I know it's hard to see, but up in the far left, that, uh, that, that same thing called hydrogen is, it, is uh, it's, it has one proton, and it's a positively charged particle, and there are electrons that are kind of circling around, uh, one electron circles around this, this proton. For helium, there are two protons, okay, helium is the, the top one on the far right, and there, here there are two protons and two neutrons, and two electrons circling around, uh, uh, around these. Uh, so what what happens is a bunch of hydrogen gets uh, they they start uh, colliding and they they get together and they make this this helium um, and this is exactly this is how it's done in the sun it's called the proton proton chain reaction and so you start up at the top take one you just have to take one row here um, where it says positron and, and proton and so on uh, there you start with two hydrogen they 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 come together. And, a, and uh, it turns out that there's a probability such that one of those photons during that collision turns into a neutron. And the way it does it is it ejects a positron. And this is an amazing thing in and of itself. I mean, we almost don't need science fiction because that's a pretty incredible thing when you think about it. Um, but anyway, so then you end up with what we call deuterium, oops, uh, which is uh, one proton and one neutron. And then that collides with a different hydrogen and that gives off a photon, a uh, gamma, right, we call photons, and then you make helium, and now that happened in another place uh, nearby, and then when those two things get together, the heliums get together, then they split off two protons, uh, and then you finally end up with helium. So this is how you go from hydrogen to helium in the star, and in between, you get a bunch of energy. So, now you know how fusion is done in the star. Uh, NIF, we do something slightly different. What we do is we do something that's a little easier. We start with deuterium, uh, like we talked about, uh, where you have a proton and a neutron, and then we have some, there's something else called tritium, which is actually three nuclei, and it is one proton, two neutrons. We kind of try, what we do is we force them together, because they're a lot easier to get together than two protons. And they get together, and, they, and when that collide collision happens, once in a while, what will happen is one of the neutrons will kind of be ripped off and you'll end up with uh, energetic helium and a neutron. And that's what, kind of what we do with NIF. So, we are actually attempting to create a miniature star uh, in, at the lab using laser fusion. So, the, the lab, the, the, the building that we put this in is about three football fields large. And this is the target chamber that goes in. It's about 10 meters wide. And that goes in, that went into the building. And now you're inside that chamber, um, and all those little holes of lasers will come through. 
And here you can see the target positioner. It looks like a pencil almost, a giant pencil that comes in. And there's going to be, we're going to put a tiny, tiny little target at the end of that. And it's going to look like this. And it's this tiny little gold can that's uh, a couple, like a couple centimeters uh, in, in size. And within that can, we put one little pellet, one little uh, bead of uh, tritium and deuterium uh, gas and a little bit of fuel covered with plastic in, and we put it inside that can. And then what we do is we shoot a lot of lasers uh, from one from the top and from the bottom into that can and we try to get fusion to happen in that little pellet. So, through the advertising, there's a couple of people that work on this stuff and they, they, they know immediately this is Nova. <laughs> anyway, uh, same, same idea. It's, I like this picture better. <clears throat> um, so, anyway, oh, uh, wait a minute. Can we, can we, uh, let's see. Can, can you play that? There's a tiny uh, a movie down there at the lower left, the lower right. Or lower, lower left. Great. So, th what this is, is this is going to walk, take you through the whole laser. Wonderful. Okay, good. So what they're going to do is they're going to shoot the laser, and we're going to follow some of the laser beams all the way from their origin into the uh, into the target chamber. Uh, maybe. <laughs> this is the control room where they, they get ready and. Uh, Clock is running. Five, four, three, two, one, shot. All right, so first thing is, is they send a bunch of energy to the, to the laser glass, which is the amplifiers. They're heating up those, they're, they're trying to get a lot of energy into some glass, and they're going to, laser beams will go through that glass. Now they're, now these are tiny little lasers, not much energy in the laser at all at this point. And it's starting to go through these preamps and preamplifiers, and they're getting amplified. So initially, they start with very small amounts of energy, and as time goes on, they start going through the amplifiers. And so they go through the there, they, just took, they got a lot of energy and they got amplified. Now they got a lot more, and they're, get, and they're going to go through them a couple more times to keep getting more and more energy put into it. Now they get some more energy. Now we're getting, now we're riding along the beam, uh, down the beam chamber, stuck in the, in the beam line, and uh, now. They're getting amplified, and this may have been the last time uh, that they went through. Now they get taken out of the amplifiers, and now they're ready. They're, they're going to be sent to the target chamber. You start seeing their target chamber in, in blue over there on the left. So now some of these are going to go up, come into the target, and some are going to go down. And you'll see that when they go through, right before they reach the target chamber, they're going to change from a red color to blue, because basically you try to upshift the frequency of the laser light. There it is. And now they're going to all go in that tiny little can that we saw earlier. And now, as time goes, now, now we're going to we're going to go to billions of seconds. And uh, the lasers hit the inside of the can. This is gold, and so it makes a lot of X-rays. And those X-rays make the plastic get very hot and it starts blowing off. And the plastic blows off the inside, pushes in, it compresses. It gets very hot. It gets small, dense, and hot, and it potentially ignites, and that's what happens. So that is how we are trying to do fusion uh, at the lab. Now, that's not the only idea, and I thought it was particularly uh, appropriate to talk about fast ignition at this uh, science fiction uh, talk. <laughs> and uh, so there are other ideas, and one of them is fast ignition. And in fact, uh, they, she mentioned that we won this uh, physics award, and it turns out that uh, one of my colleagues that also won the award is in the, in the audience, uh, Max Dayback, and we actually worked on this project several years ago, and so I, I, that's why I'm talking about this. Um, anyway, so this idea is what we do is we, we, we do a similar thing to what Nip was just talking about, where we make a com big compression of deuterium and tritium, except this time we hit that with a laser, with a short pulse laser. And instead of using shocks to ignite this, we're going to use a, we're going to use what we do is we hit the side of this DC fuel with a laser, and then what happens is how do we get we get very energetic electrons. That laser creates very 
uh, energetic electrons that go in and heat the fuel that way. And that's the way that we're trying to ignite the fuel. So, um, okay, so enough about the, the science. So what we're going to do is now we're going we're to um, talk about the positronic brain. So this is how I got involved in this to begin with, I think, is that you know people kind of associated, uh, and I'm looking at you, Bill. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, so I kind of, uh, yeah, we'll see. So anyway, um, so this is one of the big things that Asimov is known for, uh, is positronic brain. So he says, in 1939, at the age of 19, I determined to write a robot story. Since I needed a power source, I introduced a positronic brain. This was just gobbledygook, but it represented some unknown power source that was useful, versatile, speedy, and compact, like the as yet uninvented computer. So uh, now we find out, oh, he just kind of made that up. So the thing is, now how did he, why did he make that up? Why did he choose that term positron? Well, it turns out that about just before 1939, when he wrote those words, when, 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 he, when, he, when he came up with the term, uh, the positron was in fact invented, uh, or discovered, and first invented though, this is in a very unique uh, position. It turns out that Paul Dirac uh, predicted negative energy solutions for uh, the electron, theoretically, in 1928 at the age of 26. Um, he wrote down this equation, which uh, is um, the equation for the uh, amplitude for an electron, uh, and uh, it turns out that it's, it gives, if you solve it, it will kind of give you what the energy should be for the electron, or so we thought. Um, but then when he went to solve it, uh, I'm going to make a gross uh, simplification, but basically when he solved it, he got something that said, you know, something like E squared equals some stuff. So that means that E equals plus or minus the square root of some stuff. And he said, oh, well, I understand what the plus sign solution is. That's electrons. But the negative energy solution, I don't quite understand. And so he, but he thought about it and he interpreted it as a positron, uh, which was really, no one knew that that particle really invented, uh, was, uh, existed up until that time. Uh, it just was a couple years later, though, Carl Anderson actually observed positrons in a cloud chamber. Uh, and so, what, you know, as a grad student. And, he was 27, and he was doing some. He was doing these experiments with the had cloud chamber. So essentially, what it is is when a particle goes through, it makes a trap, similar to the way that a, a, an airplane will make a, a contrail in the space, uh, in, in in the atmosphere when it's uh, you know if the conditions are just right. Uh, the particle will make a trap. And I don't know how many of you can see this in um, laser form. I don't think this has a laser form. But anyway, um, you, you can you can kind of see. Uh, this track, this track here. And so uh, this, this particle came through here, and you can see that it's kind of curving this way. Well, it turns out that if it was an electron, it would curve the other way. So right away, he knew something was funny, and then he thought, well, maybe it's a proton. But it turns out that it couldn't have been a proton, because if it was a proton, it would have stopped right about here, but it kept going, which meant that it wasn't as heavy as a proton. In fact, you can tell how much curvature it had, what the mass must have been, and it turned out to have exactly had the mass of an electron. And so he thought, well, this must be the positron that, that Dirac was talking about. And so, so it was. And so this is the kind of thing, that's where, that's where he kind of got this idea to, to do this. Um, so, uh, okay. So at Livermore, we found that powerful lasers can make positrons. And uh, so how, there are actually three different ways that lasers can make positrons. Um, one way is that the laser can generate very energetic electrons, and those uh, and those electrons can interact with with one of the atoms in, in the material and create pair, and it create positrons. Okay, that we call that the trigon or the direct method. There's another method where the laser the laser can generate hot electrons, very energetic electrons. They interact with the golden nuclei, and they create a photon that will go downstream a little further and then interact with the gold to create a pair. To create a pair. When I say a pair, I mean uh, an electron and a positron pair. Okay. Um, then this is the most exciting and interesting one that's never been done, uh, and it, it, who knows when it'll be done. Uh, but basically, this is where it turns out that vacuum, if you just think about vacuum where there's nothing, just think about space where there's no, there's, there's no other particles or anything, and you say, ah, that's perfect vacuum, there's nothing there. Well, it turns out that there actually is. Um, because quantum mechanics kind of tells us that these virtual pairs, these virtual electrons and positrons are constantly popping in and out of existence. 
So even though on an average sense it looks like it's empty, it's actually filled with particles that are coming into existence and leaving, coming into existence, annihilating uh, and then being created, annihilating and being created. But uh, if you had a laser, a laser consists of an electric field that can actually separate positive and negative charges quite efficiently. And if you had a, an electric field that was strong enough, you could actually shine light, that laser or light, into vacuum and create pairs out of nothing. And so this is a pretty amazing thing when you think about it. Uh, so, you know, technically it's not nothing because the, the light is something, but there was no matter, and you start with no matter, and you suddenly end up with matter. It's a pretty cool thing. Okay, so here's some actual data on uh, positrons um, that we took at the lab. And the first thing that you can see is that, that, uh, that, that um, coming out, so let me uh, try to walk through this real quick. Uh, so the laser comes in, and hits, hits the goal, hits some goal, and then out pop some electrons in red, say, and the positrons in blue. And like I said, when you have a magnetic field, that B stands for magnetic field. When you have a magnetic field, some of the particles get turned, the, the positrons will get turned one way, and the electrons will move in the opposite direction. And by how much they get bent, we can tell what their energy was. If they're not very energetic, they get bent a lot. And so, um, but if they're, if they're very energetic, they go pretty much straight through, and we can, but we can see how many there were. You can see that there are less high energy one, uh, electrons and positrons than there are at low energy. Um, so this was some experiment, this was the ex actual experimental data that we got. Um, and that's the target after we shoot it with the laser. Now, even though this laser is a tiny fraction of a billionth of a second, it still made a giant hole in this piece of gold, which was three millimeters thick. So, we model, we can actually model this. And one of the cool things at the lab is we have these great computers. Um, we can model that, and when we modeled it, we found that, you know, oh, we got pretty good agreement with the electrons, but with the positrons, you can see the modeling are these green, uh, squares, um, the data were, were, the, were the red and the blue, and, but here we missed it. We weren't really getting that right. There was some shift in energy. If we took this and we moved that over, it looked like it would work, but, but it didn't come out that way. And so we wondered, well, what's going on here? Why, why this energy shift? Well, we started thinking about this other thing that we'd worked on previously, which was called uh, ion acceleration. And this one, again, we took a laser and hit a piece of metal. We, we do that a lot at the lab. Uh, and uh, we ended up generating a lot of electrons that went out the back, and they caused, they can, they're very light relative to the ions, they're very slow and, and heavy. But the electrons are very quick and fast, and they shot out the back, and suddenly there was a lot of electric charge behind the target, and all the ions that were sitting there said, well, we have to go, we have to go with those electrons, and so they just get accelerated quite a bit. And so then we thought, well, the ions are positively charged, I'll bet when the positrons come out, they also must get this big boost in energy. They must be getting accelerated too. And sure enough, when we put that in the model, they, it agreed quite well. So this was great. It was a mystery solved. So this is an example for you guys of you know how you can kind of have an idea of what something is when you're going into it, but you know it, it might be kind of close, but it's not really quite. It may not exactly be right, and you usually learn something. Uh, from when you actually do the experiment, you actually learn, oh, I was thinking about it kind of right, but not exactly. And so uh, it's, it's a really cool thing to, to, to be able to you know, kind of do that. Okay, so we use computers to model this interaction. Uh, this is um, a simulation where what we did is we put in uh, a bunch of electrons into a gold, and then the electrons are kind of in uh, green, uh, and then the, the photons are in yellow, and I had to really tone them down, I had to filter them out quite a bit, because if I had put how many photons we really created, it would just be nothing but a piece of yellow. Um, but basically, you can see there, there's a lot of positrons. The red are positrons, and we made a lot of positrons, and they kind of come out with that whole target. Okay, so we used a computer to, to, to model this. Um, and I took this as an opportunity to talk about the history of the computer. So, um, of course, the positronic brain served as the CPU for the robots. Uh, and, but what's the real story of computers? Well, it turns out that uh, Charles Babbage is really kind of the guy who's the father of the computer. So, uh, he invented this thing called the difference engine, which was kind of a take on... Um, you know, kind of take on a, on a calculator. 
Uh, but later, a couple years later, can you say he actually invented the analytic engine? Now, this is really kind of thought to be the first uh, program, you know, first programmable machine with no disassembly required. It turns out that before that, whenever people wanted to do a calculation, they would build a machine to do a particular calculation, and then if they wanted to do another calculation, they would take the machine apart, and then they would build it in a different way. And so, just imagine if you're a computer programmer. And you had to tell them, well, I got a new program, please, you know, rebuild the computer. That would not be a good thing. So basically what they do, it, he came up with this notion of, hey, let's make it programmable. And so that's kind of, that's why people think this is the first kind of cool program. Okay, so it turns out that Ada Lovelace, the daughter of Lord Byron, and uh, so I'm in a library, so a lot of you probably know the backstory behind this. It's pretty exciting. If you uh, ever get a chance to read stories about Lord Byron and, and this. Um, uh, in 1843, wrote a program for the analytic engine. Uh, she was known as the High Priestess of Babbage's Engine. That's how she liked to be referred to. <laughs> and uh, she is recognized as the first computer programmer. In fact, I have her program right here. Um, this is probably the first computer program ever written. Um, and unfortunately, it's not projecting well, but it's amazing if you go through it. It really does look like a computer program because this first column is the, the, the line number. Um, second column tells what the, uh, what the operator was. Was it multiply, add, divide? Um, there, are, there are variables that she's kind of setting as, time, as, the, as the statements go through. Um, and, and there's a part here where she says, here, uh, here follows a repetition of operations 13 through 23. Basically the first do loop. This is pretty cool. I put this in for... for uh, Nick. Nick. Nick is a computer programmer, so I thought he would enjoy this. Um, okay, so she was 27 when she did this. And so I don't know if you guys are noticing, but you know, these people are doing things when they're pretty young. So all you young kids, you can do a lot of stuff. <laughs> okay, well, what, what, that, uh, what, what, what is the Bernoulli numbers? Why was she even programming these things? Well, Bernoulli numbers, the Bernoulli numbers are actually perfect for a computer since the, there's a recursive equation for them. So here are the Bernoulli numbers. Okay, you see that there's not a real clear pattern here. Uh, in fact, Bernoulli number zero, the second Bernoulli number, n equal one, it doesn't even know what sign it is. Um, but basically, uh, this, is, this, is, this is the equation, and uh, you know, we're, you're not gonna have to solve it, but the important thing here is that b0, choose b0 to be one. If you put that in the equation, on the right-hand side of the equation, you can figure out what B1 is. And then once you have B1, you can put B1 on the right-hand side of the equation and figure out what B2 is. And that's just the kind of thing that computers are good at, and that's pretty much why she chose that. Now, why would she actually choose the Bernoulli numbers? It turns out that they're kind of interesting. Let's just start adding successive numbers, okay? So we can all count, one, two, three, four. Let's start adding those numbers as we go. Okay, one, we start, we end up with one. If we add two to that, we get three. If we add Three more to that, we get six. And we can do that with four, we get 10, right? And we can do that up to n, some number. Well, it turns out that the Bernoulli numbers will actually tell you what it is for any arbitrary n. So that's kind of cool. It'll give you the triangular numbers. But we can do better than that. Let's start adding the squares of the numbers. So one squared is one, two squared is four, so four plus one is five. If we add 9 to 5, we get 14, and 16 more makes 30. So now what you see is we can do this. If we do this all the way out to some arbitrary n, it turns out that we can actually write a very simple formula for that. And it's only, and what it is, is it's the Bernoulli numbers. So you can see a pattern here. In fact, you can actually do this sum of powers trick for, gener for, uh, all, for all powers of m. You can pick any m you want. And this will add, you can actually write down a very simple formula and, and get that. So this is kind of cool, and you can imagine that in her time, this must have been a really neat thing to, to think about and do. Okay, so what about modern computing, okay? Let's see. Well, modern computing kind of began in the 1930s, uh, and Alan Turing is kind of the guy who put the principles of modern computing forward uh, in a paper in 1936 when he was 24. Uh, in 1950, he actually published a seminal paper um, which, where he introduced the Turing test, which is where you know, he said, well, look, can I actually um, you know, 
I, I could be in one room and I'll put a person and a computer in another room and I'm going to have conversations with them and can I tell the difference? Which one's the person and which one's the computer? That's the, kind of the turn test. So this is kind of a cool thing for artificial intelligence and um, this is the kind of thing that uh, really, you know, he, he was very famous for. Okay, so probably the first modern computer, okay, if the modern computer is defined by, you know, a stored program, kind of electromechanical device that we kind of know it as. Um, then it was in 1938 that Conrad Zeus built the world's first one, okay, in his parents' living room. So kids, if you kind of want to do something, you know, that seems a little, you know, disruptive in the house, just remind your parents, hey, what about old Conrad here? He built a computer in the living room. <laughs> It doesn't, doesn't look like it was very, you know, safe either, does it? Okay, so I found this uh, Apple ad, um, uh, an ad for an Apple computer uh, from 1976. Uh, this was pretty interesting. Uh, they were advertising eight kilobytes of RAM, of, uh, of RAM. Eight kilobytes. Can you believe that? On 16 chips. It was incredible. And then I looked at the computer that I was working on, and it turned out... I had 12 gig, a million times more memory, just on a random computer. So it, it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing how how, how things have moved so fast in, in such a short time. Um, okay, so of course there's Sierra in the lab is very famous and well well known for doing all this uh, you know incredible computing. In fact, a lot of the work um, that that we do uh, would would not be able to be done without the computers that we that we run on. Um, it has 2.27 petabytes, um, and so you know this is 11 orders of magnitude more memory than that first Apple. So uh, you can only imagine, you know, the computing that you can do with this stuff. Uh, of course, it's no surprise there's Moore's law that says transistor density on integrated circuits doubles about every two years, um, and so uh, you put, uh, a, and then if you take those chips and you put a million chips in the same machine, you can do a lot of computing. So, interestingly, photons will probably play to replace electrons in integrated circuits. Right now, all our computers and chips, they have electrons running around through, through little wires on these little chips. Um, but now, people are actually starting to use photons, which actually was a little bit earlier than, than you know, maybe 15 years before him, but um, before uh, Asimov started talking. But basically, uh, um, you know, photon was a relatively new thing too. Anyway, both these, these photon, photonic uh, components are amazing. They're very quick. Uh, you can do, as you can imagine, they don't have to, they're not electrons, they don't have to go through material. Um, they just go through waveguides, so they're very fast. Um, you can pack huge amounts of, uh, of information in on these chips, and the and they're very efficient. They don't require much power. So that's a really big deal because these giant pop computers that we're talking about, they're very hard to power. You have to you know, build your own power plant for them. Um, so, okay, so, you know, it may well be that a photonic brain might be a reality in the future. This is kind of a cool thing. And now you can really start imagining, instead of the robots just really not moving at all or whatever, you can really get some serious compute power on, on board and get some pretty cool robots. So it brings up the point, when should you use, when, when should you the term robot be used? So for Asimov, way back when, he was thinking, okay, automatic sewing machines, television sets, self-driving cars, he put it like this, robots, uh, robot equals machine plus computer. Okay. So, uh, in fact, he said, this was, now we're going to go back to that New York Times article uh, that he wrote about the future. And he says, much effort will be put into the designing of vehicles with robot brains, vehicles that will proceed without interference by the slow reflexes of the human driver, neatly and automatically avoiding each other. And that's exactly right. That's what we have. We have the Google car, right? They're all over uh, where I live, Mountain View. Um, now, this is the most important thing. Uh, so all of you who have read iRobot know all about, you remember the, the runaround? Uh, where Speedy is running around the selenium pool and they can't figure out how to get him back. And they start talking about the three fundamental laws of robotics, right? Uh, and so what are they? Okay, a robot may not, number one, fund the first fundamental law, a robot may not injure a human being. Number two, 
A robot must obey orders given to it by humans. And three, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, you might think, wow, what is he, why was he even thinking about that kind of stuff? Well, it turns out he, he had some interesting words here. He said, those laws, as it turned out, proved to be the most famous, the most frequently quoted, and the most influential sentences I have ever wrote. And I did it when I was just 21, which makes me wonder if I've done anything since to continue to justify my existence. <laughs> those are pretty strong words for a guy who wrote hundreds of books. I mean, this guy, <laughs> I just can't believe him questioning himself. Uh, anyway, so, but, but, but it really is kind of interesting that he was so far ahead of his time, he was actually worrying about these kinds of issues. You know, self-driving cars bring a whole new level of meaning, of, of, of wondering or meaning to these three laws of robotics. So consider this scenario, okay? It's 2040, okay? And I'm 80 years old. And for some reason, I've retired to Savannah, Georgia. And my self-driving car is crossing the Talmadge Bridge, there, shown there. Uh, and a father and son are on vacation, uh, and they're walking along the bridge, and suddenly the child darts out in front of the car. The car has several options, and of course, by Moore's law, it has, you know, three billion, billion, uh, you know, circuits uh, on, on its little, little chip. And it has plenty of time to make a decision, so what does it do? Well, certainly not going to do anything with the kid. That's number one because, you know, he's, he might be 20 and he's going to be in his 20s soon and he might do something really cool. Uh, so, you know, and then it's probably thinking, well, let's see, I drive off the bridge. You know, Scott's pretty old. <laughs> Should I do that? But, you know, what, it's probably going to use uh, some algorithm like this, uh, you know, like the three laws um, to, to really make these decisions. Now, but what, but what will the car do? Well... It turns out that it flies up and avoids everyone. <laughs> so when everyone wonders where are the flying cars, then it's going to be the drone. I mean, you think you see these drones all over, right? You see them, you know, and they're in, you know your neighbor's flying the drone and it gets caught in the trees, and you know, it, they 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 got now they've got drones that they actually take people places. They're going to have drones that deliver Amazon packages. So. Really, this is kind of probably going to not be that far from the future, so we'll, we'll see. Um, anyway, there's, there's just one problem with flying drones. Uh, and let's just take a look here. Have a look at these pictures that have come into us of the downhill skiing champion Marcel Hirscher, uh, who is being filmed partly by a drone, and uh, you're going to see what happens in just a second here. Look behind him. One. Uh, there it is, falling out of the sky, missing him really by what a fraction, maybe not even a tenth of a second. Yeah, I hope he pushed what he saw again, what he expected. Um, yeah, it's for me absolute freakhead. So it's can't passieren, but so it's echt nicht passieren. Ah, der vergaß ihn auch denken, was da passieren kann. Um, ja, wer auch immer verantwortlich ist für das Budget, passt auch besser. Whoever is responsible, please be more careful next time. <laughs> okay, only uh, only German can be so polite. Uh, let's go go to the so um, oh so you know so you, so so he says you know please be please be more careful. You know you, you think about it and you think uh, you know people would never never program machines to do really crazy things, would they? <laughs> anyway, okay, well listen, you made it, all made it to the end of the, the, the talk, and this was great. Only Max fell asleep. <laughs> I'm kidding, Max, I'm kidding. Uh, okay, and uh, so anyway, so what, what sets us apart from robots? So, I don't know, if, how, how many of you seen the movie Lucy? Oh, wow, you got all, oh, most of you have a wonderful treat in store for you. It's a great movie, please go see it, it's, it's really fun. Um, so anyway. Uh, a couple months ago, as I was putting this together, I, I, I kind of, uh, I was, while we were watching the show, I was watching the show with my wife, and, uh, and they, they really, they were asking a lot of these same questions, and, and I think it listed three important traits that really set us apart from robots. Um, okay, number one, we, we can feel desire, they can't, okay? Um, you know, they, they, we feel pain, and, you know, when these robots fall down at the DARPA challenge, they, they don't really feel anything. Um, and 
feel pleasure. You know, I, I doubt if my self-driving car is going to, you know, feel happy to deliver me safely to home. You know, and I, so I thought this is great. They did a great job in Lucy to kind of get this, but I think they missed one of the most important things that set us apart from robots, and that is our love of bacon. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for your attention, and. Uh, Any questions? Yes? Does the lab have a science fiction book club? Ooh, uh, that's a good question. I don't know if it does or not. Is Nick, do you know? Uh, yeah. Is it library? Yes, it does. Are you a member, Nick? No, actually not. Okay, but, but it does exist. Uh, yes, and is, do you know if there's a website for it? or? Uh, oh. Uh, I'm sorry, I was looking for the lights from the question. Oh, so the question is, is, does the lab have a science fiction book club? No, we do not. Uh, we have book clubs yeah. that are private. Well, they did. But not sort of a lab-wide book club that... Okay. The, the people who are private yeah. have a good idea. The library. Okay. I think the library does. The library does. Oh, great. Library. Oh, okay, good. Cool. All right. Uh, any other? Any? Yes. Yes, you're right. 